Welcome once again to this self-knowledge course. Today we will be looking at the topic, exotericism, pseudo-esotericism and esotericism, in which we will learn to differentiate between the different types of beliefs, philosophical and spiritual currents and knowledges that exist to discover what knowledge will really have transcendental value in us. When we have spiritual concerns, when we want to find answers to the unanswered questions that we keep inside us, or when we feel that inner impulse to seek a union with that which is superior to us. We find that there are lots of knowledges, theories, religions, dogmas, etc., that aim to lead us to knowledge about the divinity and superior realities. So, the objective of this conference will be to help us distinguish between them, to learn to distinguish a pseudo-esoteric school from an esoteric school. It will also help us understand what our current position in knowledge is, and when the true experience of esoteric work begins. Let's start then by talking about the first type of knowledge. Let's talk about exotericism. What is exotericism? It is external knowledge. We receive external knowledge from many sources during our whole life. For example, at school since we are children, also from our parents, relatives, through the media, at the university, on the internet, in the different courses we take during our lives, in different books we read, etc. External knowledge is always received through the personality. Our personality is that way of being that we form as we grow, and that is what we express ourselves to the world with, and it is marked by our tastes and interests. Therefore, all this external knowledge is not received directly by our consciousness, but rather it is our personality and our intellect that receive and are nourished by this knowledge. And as we grow, according to the tastes and interests of our personality, the types of knowledge that we will be attracted to seek and receive will be. For example, many of us came to this course because we liked the topics on astral projection, meditation, spirituality, etc. And that led us to search among everything that was offered to us as knowledge of this kind, and that currently abounds in all media. But it is difficult among so much knowledge that is currently shown, to obtain pure knowledge, knowledge that gives us clear and precise teachings and practices that allow us to really advance in our inner work. Among so much knowledge that there is today, it is truly a privilege to find pure knowledge. Among a thousand who search for it, one finds it. Not everyone manages to find pure knowledge, and they remain entangled and lost in schools and knowledge that do not actually lead to that long-awaited inner knowledge. Even because of karma, there are many who have no right to a pure knowledge in this existence, because they have received it in past existences, and have rejected it or made a bad use of it. Then, in this existence, they don't find it, and if they do, they pass by. But it is important to know that when a person receives this knowledge, he also receives it as exoteric knowledge. The entire course of self-knowledge is exoteric knowledge, since we receive it externally, and it is our personality that receives it. And if we don't put it into practice, it will remain just another theory, a very nice concept that sounds very logical. That is why in the Conference on Fanaticism and Mythomania, we said that when a person receives the knowledge of the three factors, two paths are opened for him. The first is the path of the believer. And this is the one taken by everyone who receives this knowledge, but takes it as just another piece of information. Then the person chooses to believe this because it resonates with them, because it seems logical, because it seems good to them, or because they find it interesting but they will not make the effort to actually put it into practice to directly verify these teachings. The believer only accumulates knowledge. The believer dedicates himself to believing and absorbing information from someone who seems wise or intelligent, or close to God. If the believer is an intellectual then he reads many books on the subject, seeks the opinion of one and the other, is well documented, speaks very beautifully and very cultured on the subject. But, since he does not practice, he doesn't verify for himself any of those things he believes on. The second is the path of the one who practices. 
This is the path taken by everyone who receives this knowledge and practices it. This is the one who is not satisfied with just believing, but rather puts the tools learned into practice and checks for himself. He learns about astral projection, but he is not satisfied with just knowing about that topic, he practices until he experiences it. He learns about psychological death, but he understands that believing or not believing is not going to make him achieve changes in himself. Therefore, he puts it into practice, and he verifies it. He begins to verify the changes that begin to occur in his way of thinking, feeling, and acting. And on the astral plane, he also begins to verify the result of psychological death. He learns about reflective meditation, then he dedicates himself to practicing it, and begin to achieve important understandings. He learns to negotiate his karmas, puts it into practice, and verifies it. He learns about spiritual birth, and he practices it. He achieves chastity, lights the sacred fire, receives his sword, begins to condense energy in his spine and begins to perform his initiations of major mysteries. Thanks to this, the practical one enters a mesoteric stage. He starts living the path. This mesoteric stage is the means to reach esotericism. But few are those who take the path of the one who practices. Actually, out of a thousand who find pure knowledge, only one follows it by practicing it. Now let's talk about pseudo-esotericism. Esotericism means inner knowledge. Therefore, pseudo-esotericism is false inner knowledge. Something that looks like inner knowledge but is not. This false inner knowledge is related to all those theories that exist in the world, religions, sects, concepts, masters, pastors, ministers, and schools in general, that teach us that through them we can unite with divinity, or achieve liberation, or that promise us that by following their teachings we will achieve the salvation of our soul. Currently there are more than 5,000 religions in the world, without counting the sects, and they all have something in common, they all claim to be the only place that has the truth, and that the rest are wrong. Among so many unproven theories, the person enters a state of confusion. That is why many simply follow the religion of their parents or those close to them, so as not to get complicated with the number of religions and theories that exist. And they end up convincing themselves that through faith they will achieve salvation. However, all these schools, sects, and religions only fight to see which has the most souls, which is the one that manages to attract the most people, and all this has become only a soul's merchandising, which does not lead anyone to truly achieve a connection with God inside them. However, when we make the decision to begin to get out of so many conditionings that have been imposed on us, and we begin to investigate these schools, currents, sects, and religions in the internal worlds, we realize that none of them are really going to lead us to an inner knowledge, as they only lead us to belief and fanaticism. It is easy to see how humanity is currently immersed in two poles. On the one hand, all people are immersed in the deepest materialism, focused on the search for luxuries, money, prestige, trips, cars, possessions, good work, fame, etc. But at the same time, they are immersed in the deepest psychism, which is that false spiritualism, where everyone belongs to, or is searching for, some spiritual current, some sect, religion, or mystical philosophy. And we see how they mix both things, because people go to the place of congregation, and pray to the divinity in which they believe, or seek to join spiritual groups, but for what? To ask the divinity for material things, or to learn how to use spirituality to attract material abundance. And due to this, the pseudo-esoteric schools that most attract people are those that promise their followers abundance and material prosperity. And in this way tie them and link them energetically to these schools to benefit from their followers. So, it is very important that we learn to recognize a pseudo-esoteric school, so as not to get entangled in one of these, and lose our way towards self-knowledge, awakening of consciousness, and final liberation. There are all kinds of pseudo-esoteric schools, we are going to see that they all have certain characteristics that we must consider, to begin to distinguish if the one to which we belong, or want to belong to, 
is a pseudo-esoteric school. Some of the characteristics of a pseudo-esoteric school that we could observe are First, they charge for knowledge. And they do it in a direct or indirect way. Many pressure you to give your offering or pay your tithes. Others directly have monthly dues from their members. Others relate esotericism to the sale of perfumes, oils, talismans, candles, books, filters, minerals, drinks, robes, etc. And so, they deceive many who believe that by doing these things they are ensuring the salvation of their soul or achieving some inner advance. Another characteristic is that they don't teach the three factors for the revolution of consciousness. They don't give the precise practices to achieve the awakening of consciousness. They don't teach how to achieve spiritual birth through white tantrism or suprasex. Rather, they teach black tantrism, since they don't teach people to achieve chastity, to value their sexual energy and make wise use of it by uniting sexually with a stable partner of the opposite sex, and making their sexual energy ascend through their spine to their superior centers, without ever reaching orgasm or ejaculation. They give people the license to fornicate when marrying them. Some even recommend celibacy or rejection of sex to get closer to divinity, and others don't give greater importance to the sexual issue. And don't guide people on the sacredness of sex, the transcendental value of sexual energy, and the power that wise use of sex has to awaken consciousness. They do not teach how to truly die, since they don't teach how to free consciousness through psychological death. But they teach many distracting methods that do not really lead to achieving a root change in the person. Or they teach people that their sinful acts will be forgiven if they simply believe or pray, and they do not teach them how to truly eradicate from within themselves the root of evil, which is the ego. They also do not teach how to pay our karmas. They don't teach that through acts of sacrifice for humanity, we can make the merits to stop paying with pain for our past bad actions. Nor do they teach that karma is due and can be paid in full in a single existence. They don't teach that karma can be negotiated, or how to negotiate it. They say that all roads lead to Rome. And with this false theory they entangle people, leading them to believe that it doesn't matter who they follow, because just by believing and being faithful to a belief they will be saved. Pseudo-esoteric schools are driven mainly by intellectualism, but not by direct practice that leads to verification. They suggest or affirm that esoteric knowledge can be learned from books. They give confusing teachings. Teachings that seem ineffable, but that lead nowhere. They teach many things, which in the end are just distracting elements that entertain people, but that never lead them to seek for the truth within them. Pseudo-esoteric schools develop fanaticism and mythomania in their followers. They move them through fear and mystical pride. They mix forces. Because they always end up mixing things of a superior nature with negative forces and entities. And when one mixes forces, the original force is lost, while a third force arises, which is destructive. It makes people's inner advancement impossible and attaches them to that belief. Many teach Black Lodge practices, like many forms to awaken powers and spiritual faculties, but without eliminating the ego. They also teach the handling of candles, cards, crystals, and pendulums. They teach parapsychology, spiritualism, mediumship, witchcraft, and manipulation of elementals. Many are dedicated to teaching and practicing different forms of healing. But they heal without having permission from divine law. We know that every illness is a karma that is being paid with pain. By curing a person without the permission of divine justice, they are violating the law and bringing more karma to that person in the future. In addition to the fact that, those who give them the power to heal are not superior beings, but negative entities. And when they heal people, they are linking them to those entities that are giving them the power to heal. From then on, that entity has the right to constantly claim the energy of the person who owes it the favor. It is important that you investigate these things on the astral plane, so that you become aware of these realities. 
and one of the main characteristics of a pseudo-esoteric school is that they do not teach that self-realization should be sought and that it should be achieved in a single existence. Therefore, they deprive people of seeking and achieving the purpose of their existence. All this means that, little by little, we lose confidence in our own inner being, and we end up trusting in external elements. All kinds of negative entities and black magicians take advantage of this and found all kinds of pseudo-esoteric schools to divert souls. They also distort knowledge, since all religions and philosophical currents, in their beginnings, had the pure inner knowledge. However, with time and the decline of the race, were entering into decay, and when they are investigated internally it is found how their principles have been deviated, and the vast majority are directed by black magicians who externally show ineffable appearances, but by investigating them on the astral plane, each of us can reach to verify the reality behind the appearance. The main difference between a white magician and a black magician is the quality of their knowledge. That is why we have the duty to become reflective and, above all, investigate in the internal worlds by asking our inner being to show us on the astral plane the reality of anyone from whom we are receiving some type of teaching and verify any teaching that we are receiving, including this one. When we read the book of a black magician, even if we don't know it, we are invoking him. Let's study finally, what is esotericism? Esotericism is inner knowledge or occult knowledge. This is the knowledge of our inner being, which we will receive as we eliminate so many layers of egoic conditioning, as we advance in the work of creating our internal bodies, and as we do our research with the different verification techniques that we are learning. Inner knowledge is received in the inner worlds and is always received by our consciousness. Esoteric knowledge is for consciousness, it is not possible to obtain this knowledge in any external place, anywhere in the physical world, in any conduct manual, books or school of the external world. In the physical world we can only receive the guidelines and techniques to seek and access inner knowledge, but this is only obtained if we put those tools into practice, and access that inexhaustible source of knowledge that resides within us. True esotericism seeks knowledge of oneself, and through this, that we achieve the intimate self-realization of our being. And all the mental and spiritual development that we will achieve as we advance in the development of our own inner knowledge, is what is going to help us free ourselves, awaken our consciousness, and help others so that they also have the opportunity to awaken their consciences and seek their own self-realization. Esoteric knowledge is only reached through the three factors of the revolution of consciousness, which are the only three objective works that must be done, psychological death, spiritual birth, and conscious sacrifice for humanity. To the extent that we release consciousness with psychological death, each of the sparks currently trapped in the ego are being released, and receives the knowledge that should receive, according to its vocation. To the extent that we create the different bodies, we have access to the wisdom of the different dimensions of nature. And to the extent that we make our efforts to share the knowledge that we acquire, our inner knowledge multiplies, because whoever gives light, the light increases for him, and he who gives wisdom, receives wisdom. In the internal worlds we are going to receive a lot of knowledge. However, there is a lot of this information that is very personal, that is only for us, and that we should not share with anyone else. Especially the information related to our different inner advances and initiations, and things that directly concern only our inner being. So, when we internally receive esoteric knowledge in a closed book, it is knowledge for our being only. Therefore, it cannot be revealed in the external world, so we must know how to keep silent. But if the knowledge that is received internally is received in an open book, it can be delivered to our students. Each being has its own knowledge, and to the extent that consciousness awakens and comes into harmony with nature, we are given the wisdom that we had a long time ago. Let's remember that only he who, upon receiving the knowledge of the three factors, takes the path of the practical, is the one who will enter that mesoteric stage that will lead him to true esotericism. 
the one who practices checks with the three factors and the different practices learned. He makes his initiations of major mysteries until finishing the first mountain of the initiation. When the second mountain begins is when he already lends hope for esoteric knowledge. But it is when he goes through the resurrection process, after having eliminated all his psychological defects, that he enters the esoteric school of his ray as an adept. And already on the third mountain, when he integrates the three main forces of his being into one, and when he achieves complete fusion with his inner father, is when he becomes a true esotericist. It is at that moment when he reaches the first level of universal wisdom. So, we see that it takes serious and hard work to achieve enlightenment, or inner knowledge, which is to become a real esotericist. However, most students make the mistake of feeling esotericist when they are just beginning to receive these conferences. Feeling initiated without having started practicing supersex. Feeling holy without having eliminated the first psychological defect. Or feeling practical without having even started practicing. And all this occurs because of the false feeling of the self. So, we must avoid falling into self-deception and rather dedicate ourselves, judiciously and disciplined, to the practice. Let's remember that to the extent that consciousness awakens and we enter into harmony with nature, we are given the wisdom that we had a long time ago. This has been today's conference. Any questions you have, remember to leave them in the comment section. Here I leave you the invitation for the next topic, in which we will talk about the world of relationships. In that topic we will discover how to improve our different relationships. The relationship we have with our physical body, with other people and the planet, and the relationship with our inner being, so that we can achieve true happiness. Don't miss that interesting topic. Until next time.